As mentioned, the text for this morning is 2 Peter chapter 1, 1 through 11. We've read that whole passage already, so we won't read it again immediately here, but we will be making our way through it to the course of the sermon. So I invite you to keep your Bibles open to follow along. After the sermon, we will sing in response to the wondrous proclamation of the gospel, hymn 61, stanzas 1 and 2. Hymn 61, 1 and 2, after the sermon. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, have you ever been in a situation that was so unlikely, so surprising or impossible that you had to stop and ask yourself if whatever was happening, if if that was really happening? There's a, there's a common phrase that maybe is familiar to most of us, and that is, you know, I had to pinch myself. I had to pinch myself to make sure that I wasn't dreaming. Times where the, the most wonderful and unexpected series of events unfolded in, in such a surprising way, and you found yourself in a situation that maybe you had only dreamed of, almost too good to be true. There are a lot of stories, you know, books, you know, films that contain this this special element. You know, for example, an unknown, uh, an obscure, relatively untalented athlete who suddenly and surprisingly gets the opportunity to compete at some event at the highest level possible alongside all of the champions that he or she had, had always admired. I can't believe that I'm here. I have to pinch myself to make sure that that this is real. This can't possibly be happening. It's unreal. Well, there's a phrase here in in 2 Peter 1 that, that ought to give us that same miraculous and and sense of of amazement. 2 Peter 1 verse 4, one of the most amazing ideas that as human beings we could ever comprehend through the great and precious promises of God, listen to this, you have become partakers of the divine nature. Through the great and precious promises of God, you may become partakers of the divine nature. That's a staggering idea. There is no higher idea possible for human beings. Here is God, on the one hand, our understanding of God, His holiness, His might, He's so high above us, so great in majesty and glory. God who dwells in unapproachable light. God who is so fearsome that that we know that we would die, literally die, if we saw all of his glory. And, And yet at the same time so wonderful in love and grace. To think that we could somehow experience, truly experience God in all of his godness. How far beyond us is he? And yet, the Apostle Peter is reminding us Christians that God is not only, he's he's not out of our reach, but that he in ways that only could be his ways, he has made us share with him in his glory. Share with him in who he is. Share somehow, in some way, in the divine. We participate in the life of God, the glory of God. You are not normal people, as we know people from our earthly perspective. You are not normal people, humanly and in a sinful, 
according to our sinful nature and in the state of the world, you are people who have been thrust into the greatest thing possible, life with God. Life with God. You have been made able to enjoy His glory. God has informed us that what lies ahead for us is a life of of sitting with God, taking counsel with God Himself, acting as His counselors being shaped as members of his divine, royal household, we should feel like we have to pinch ourselves. This is staggering. How could we not be dreaming that these are the promises of God? That God would give us a life like this. And when the Apostle Peter reminds us of this wonderful state that we find ourselves in as Christians, he ascribes all credit for this to God. 2 Peter 1 verse 3, his divine power. After, after introducing himself, after the opening of his letter, this is how he begins it. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. God has done this. Through the knowledge of him, the one who called us into his own glory and excellence. This is not our invention. This is not something we came up with. This is the work of God from beginning to end. Your status with God, your supernatural life, which is what this is, your supernatural life, this is a result of his divine power. Through his promises, the promise of the gospel, God has powerfully worked on you to receive all of the benefits of Jesus Christ. The wisdom and power of God has brought about salvation for you. He has opened the way. He has made it possible, sending his son Jesus Christ as the sacrifice for your sins, right? We read there in verse 5. Through him you escape the corruption of the world. You escape the plague of sin that leads to complete death and destruction. Through his power we have escaped those things. It was actually verse 4, not not verse 5. Pardon me. God has opened the way for you to be able to live with him. And now, he has issued to each one of you who bear his name, who have been called to this kind of life, he has issued to each of you a divine calling. He has called you to his own glory and excellence. Verse 3, the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Our God, holy, holy, holy God, the Lord God Almighty, through Jesus Christ, through Christ's work, through his death and his resurrection. He's first of all made it possible. He's opened the way for you to be with him, but now he has called you. He has issued a call for you to be with him. God has called you to be partakers of his glory, partakers of the divine. A very special calling indeed. The Lord God Almighty has summoned you to come and live in his house. And for that reason, says the the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Peter, for that reason, since God has done such wonderful things, since we've been called to such lofty things, for that reason... Says the Apostle Peter, verse 5, make every effort then to supplement your faith with virtue. 
Virtue with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. Make every effort because of what God has done, because of this high calling that he has called you with, make every effort to put on the following qualities. And next week, the Lord willing, we'll be able to spend more time going through each one of these, understanding how to cultivate these things by the grace of God with his help and his strength. Peter is saying here, God has made you a partaker of the divine, and now you ought to strive to shape your lives accordingly by the grace of God. God has made you members of his household, and now your lives ought to reflect that. I'm reminded of a, a, a film that made a similar, a similar point. The film was one where this you know, regular teenage girl discovers that she actually by birth is a princess and at some point in her life she is made aware of this and she discovers this and suddenly she is called. She, is, she has this obligation thrust upon her to fulfill her role as the inheritor of, of, of this noble office with the view to becoming queen. She's been made aware of who she really is and now she has to understand and learn how to conform her life to her identity. Lots of preparation, lots of practice, classes about how to conduct oneself as royalty. And it required such diligence and single-mindedness of, of goal here. At all times, thinking about this high calling that she was being called to. I'm going to be a queen. I have to somehow become that in all parts of life, right? And what a cute story. What a fun, uplifting, uplifting story that was. And, and that's something that causes the heart to swell to imagine, you know, something like that. Suddenly going from normal life to becoming royalty, becoming the, the ruler of a, of a nation. How lofty that idea is. How much more something like this, it doesn't even compare. Christians, you are children and heirs of the Lord God Almighty. You inherit this world. You will be the rulers of this world for all time. You have been made part of the divine royal family, the family of God. How much more urgent then is the call and duty that has been thrust upon you to be conformed to who you really are, people of God, partakers of the divine. There are two ways to live. And at all times, we're confronted with one way or the other, as we read from Psalm 1. There is the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And one, lay, one way is the life of blessedness and joy and peace, a life with God. And the other is an empty way that leads to destruction. You've been called to the way of righteousness because this is appropriate for who you are as members of the household of God. And the grace of God demands, and just be careful here, the grace of God demands in response our diligence, our efforts. And we don't put forward effort for, in, in order to earn something from God. We know this so clearly. We, we cannot 
earn something from God. Everything we receive from God is, is a gift of grace given to us for free in love and mercy. But the grace of God that he has extended to us results in something and it demands something. It demands a response, a faithful response. God causes you to participate in his existence and let us be eager in that. Be eager to live accordingly. Respond in faith and love to the grace of God by putting on these qualities. And if these qualities, and again, we'll go through these qualities next week, the Lord willing. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's your second point. Along with the joy of receiving this high calling, right? Receiving this wonderful Amazing news that you actually, you're not regular people, but you are royalty, you're divine royalty, that you're heirs of the Lord God Almighty. Along with that news, that joyous news, along with that comes actually this, this warning against being idle or ineffective. You remember those, the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? There's a, a master who is going away for some time and he has, he has servants in his household and he gives them each a, a job to do and he gives them the resources to, to discharge the duties that they have. One servant receives five talents of gold or silver or whatever it was, five talents of, of, of money, we'll say. Another receives two and another one. And while the master is away... One of them invests and puts that, those resources to work and doubles it. Uh, the one with five did that. The one with, that received two talents did the same thing, put it to work, invested it, um, was uh, an effective you know, worker, putting those things to use. When his master returned, uh, he was able to say, you gave me two talents, here are an additional two talents. And both of these first two servants were commended for what they did. The one who received one talent, he didn't put it to work wisely. Instead, he buried it in the ground and, and let it sit there until his master came home. He dug it back and gave it to him just as it was. And their master, their master came with a very terrible judgment on the one who was unfaithful and who didn't work faithfully with the resources that God had given. Their master, the Lord, he expected a good return on what he had apportioned to his servants. And the lesson from this, that kingdom truth that we receive from this, this instruction that we receive from this, is that the Lord of the kingdom of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, is in charge of the harvest of this world, the fruitfulness of the work of the kingdom, the work of the church, and he has given each one of you. This isn't just for special offices, but this is for everyone who bears the name of Christ. He has given each one of you certain gifts. He has made you stewards of certain resources with the expectation that you will provide for your Lord Jesus Christ a return on what he has entrusted to you. And Peter here is, is warning against ineffectiveness, unfruitfulness. Make sure that when the Lord Jesus Christ, our master, returns, we present him with the fruits of our labor in his name. You have entrusted me with this. This is what I've done with it. I give this to you, Master, Lord Jesus Christ. He will least ask each one of us, or demand that each one of us give an account of what we have done with what he has entrusted to us. Well, what has he entrusted to us? Well, God has entrusted us with many things. He has given you certain personalities that are to be used in certain ways for the benefit of the church, for the advancement of the kingdom of heaven, and they're all different you know, he, he doesn't call every single one of you to be the one who organizes and leads Bible studies or to be on this committee or that committee. You know, he has 
he has given that to this person or that person and, and maybe not to you, but he has given you something else. He has given you other gifts and you must find out what those are. What are those five talents or two talents of gold that he expects a return on? Is it something like God has entrusted you with children and he has given you the obligation to instruct your children, teaching your children the ways of God to go forth generation to generation? Has he entrusted you with, with tangible resources, financial blessings that belong to God? The whole earth is the Lord's and everything in it. Whatever you have, financial blessings, these do not belong to you. They belong to the Lord. He has made you a steward of them for a little while and you give him a return on those things in whatever way. One thing he has given to all of us in varying degrees is, is time. We each have 24 hours in a day. How do we use those hours? How are you using your time in order to be effective and fruitful in the kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ? This morning we have the wonderful blessing of receiving four new elders and deacons. And how heavily these things come to rest upon you. These thoughts about the duties that have been put on your shoulders and the manner in which you are to carry them out as ambassadors of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. There's a special calling that each of you have received and, and which you are looking ahead to fulfilling. And, and of course, there's always this fear and insecurity, uneasiness about this office that you, these offices that you are stepping into or that you have entered upon. How in the world can you carry out your offices? Not only these new office bearers that we have, but all of you who are currently serving and, and who will be serving for the next while. Well, back to point one. Be eager to put on godly qualities. These things will keep you from being ineffective and unfruitful. Not only for your own faith, for the sake of your own eternal life, but also, and especially this morning, we consider for the eternal sake of those who are in your charge. And suddenly it gets very heavy and serious. Maybe we're filled with concern discouragement when we think of the ways that we have fallen short of this. We failed to discharge the duties that God has given to us. We know that we all need to be forgiven for our you know, laziness or our weakness. We've been hampered by weaknesses that remain in us against our will. How are we going to be judged by this or judged for this? Is all this in jeopardy because of our weaknesses? Let's not be afraid of this. Don't be afraid of this. Peter directs us right back to God. We can't do these things of ourselves. We know that. What a relief that we don't have to depend on ourselves. Peter here is reminding us of the terrifying weightiness of the calling that we've all received. You are called to life in the household of God, some as, as office bearers with a special obligation, as ambassadors of Christ. And, and all of us here as Christians, ones who bear the name of Christ, how could we ever live up to this? Be eager, be diligent, we're told. Be all the more diligent to confirm, confirm that is in your hearts. Be sure of this, your calling and election, which is from God. For if you practice these qualities, this is verses uh, 10 and 11, 
If you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Be diligent to confirm your calling and election. These things have their origin in God. What a relief. They have their origin in God. God has given all of this. God has started all of this. God is at work. Be eager, in other words, be eager to see the work of God. He is faithful here. And we will see his work. We read this passage together at our last consistory meeting just a few days ago. And we were greatly encouraged, as, as we have always been, when we are reminded that our work does not depend upon us. How quickly we become discouraged because of our weaknesses and the ways that we have failed. We ask forgiveness for our weaknesses, but then we are reminded we have forgiveness for those things, and God equips. God is at work. God will finish the good work that he has started here. The building of the kingdom of heaven begins and ends with the grace of God through Jesus Christ. It is God who has designed our life. It is God who has instituted the church. He has called this congregation into being. It's God who made the way of salvation for us and brought it about, secured it for us. It is God who called all of you to this. It is God who provides the means of grace, our growth together through the preaching of his word and the use of the sacraments. It is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure So with great expectation and confidence, then we are able to be eager and diligent to strive. These commands are given, and when you strive and you toil in this, and you look and you take stock of the progress and growth in, in your life and in the congregation, what do we recognize? We recognize the mighty hand of God in all of this is from grace to grace. In this way, again, verse 11, we are not clawing our way into the kingdom of heaven on our own. No, we read something different in verse 11. In this way, there will be richly provided for you. It's provided for you. An entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God has made you a partaker of the divine. God has yanked you out of the meaningless, fruitless, destructive corrupt world, and he has escorted you into his heavenly joy and glory. God has done this. May God bless your efforts. May God grant you diligence in your respective roles in his kingdom, all of you, whatever they are. May God confirm for you in your hearts his calling and election. May he confirm these things with the evidence of, of beautiful fruit in your lives and in the lives of this church. To God be praised for all of this. Amen.